I'd like to welcome you all to the first webinar in UC Irvine Extension's seventh annual GATE webinar series. Today's topic is Motivating the Gifted but Reluctant Learner. This session is being recorded and the archive will be available within 24 hours. If you registered through Extension's free events website, you will automatically receive an email with a link to this recording. If for some reason you do not receive that email, you can access the archive manually by going to uci.webex.com and then searching for this webinar's title. And it, now again, I know a majority of you did register through the free events website, so if you did, um, we already have your information and you should be automatically receiving an email tomorrow with the link to the recording. My name is Lisa Kotowaki and I'm a program manager here at UC Irvine Extension. Here's a brief overview of what we're going to cover in this session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features so you'll know how to submit questions to our featured speaker throughout her presentation. Next, I will provide you with some information about several GATE resources offered through UCI Extension, including our fully online Gifted and Talented Education Specialized Studies Program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and some upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins March 30th. I will then hand it over to Diane Hecox, as she will be presenting on today's topic, Motivating the Gifted but Reluctant Learner. At the end of her presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session, and finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send me any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any te technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to UCI Eric, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for our speaker regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the chat panel, and we will address it at the end if we have time. So you'll want to look at the, if you don't already see the chat panel on your screen, You'll want to look in the upper right-hand corner, and you should see a row of icons. Go ahead and click on that chat bubble icon, and the chat panel will show up. And when you do submit your questions, we do ask that you submit them to all panelists, and that way um, both the speaker and myself will be able to see them come in. Here's a brief overview of the GATE Specialized Studies program we have here at UC Irvine Extension. Our certificate program is fully online and consists of three required courses and three elective units. Our program is taught by a team of experienced instructors and is designed for individuals both new to the field as well as current GATE educators seeking professional development opportunities. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all nine units with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed request for certificate form. The courses and program, they range from $375 to $500 per course, um, depending on the unit value. You may take individual courses without pursuing the entire program. Here's a list of the required and elective courses that make up our GATE certificate program. The topics covered in the program will help you develop a new skill set and gain a deeper understanding of the needs and issues of this diverse group of students. Now, when viewing the course schedule online, you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so you do want to plan accordingly. Please pay close attention to the unit value of each course because this dictates the course fee and how long each course will last. So for example, you can expect learning styles, which is a one unit course, to cost $375 and last three weeks online, while differentiated instruction is a three unit course and costs $500 and lasts 10 weeks online. The nice thing about our program is that you can earn your certificate in as little as nine months and you can choose elective topics of greatest interest to you. As you may already know, UC Irvine Extension hosts an online gate community that is free and open to the public. Please follow the directions on this slide to become a member, and you will gain access to valuable resources, news, and events regarding gate. 
Recordings of all of our past webinars are also available through the community, which are great resources to continue looking back on. So again, feel free to send me an email with your full name and email address um, if you want access to the community. Here is a list of the courses that we are offering in the upcoming spring quarter for required courses, differentiated instruction, and for elective courses, learning styles, and engaging students through technology. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee. The schedule and enrollment information are also posted on our website, and enrollment is currently open, and students can enroll either online or by calling our student services office at the number provided. We do encourage students to enroll at least two weeks prior to the start of a course. UC Irvine Extension also provides individual courses, specialized in services, and the entire GATE certificate program on site or online to schools and districts at reduced prices. We currently work with school districts who are putting cohort, cohorts of teachers through our GATE program and are receiving 10, 15, or 20% off the course fees. So with some, we send our university-approved instructors to teach the classes on-site at their district office, and with others, we provide convenient online courses. So in any case, regardless of the delivery format, we hope that there is an opportunity for UCI Extension to meet your GATE training needs. If you wish to learn more about our program and our discount offers, please feel free to contact me. Later this month, California Association for the Gifted, uh, commonly referred to as CAG, is hosting its annual conference in Palm Springs, California. UCI Extension is proud to be a credit provider for this event. In order to receive one unit of credit, individuals must attend the CAG conference, submit an official enrollment form with payment, and write a three-page reflection paper summarizing what you learned at the conference and how you will apply what you learned to your teaching practice. The credit will appear on an official transcript that can be used as proof of professional development or towards requirements for salary advancement. So for those of you who are attending the conference, Feel free to look for our enrollment form at our table that we'll have there, or you can also send me an email in advance and I can send you all of the instructions and all the details as well as the enrollment form that you'll need. We are also offering a credit option for those of you who plan on attending all of the live webinars in this seventh annual series. In order to receive one unit of credit, and that's a quarter unit uh, because we run on the quarter system and not the semester system. Individuals must attend all four live webinars totaling four hours. You must stay logged in for the entire length of the webinar and live attendance will be verified. Credit will not be given for watching recordings of the webinars. You must submit an official enrollment form with payment or write a three-page reflection paper summarizing what you learned from the series and also turn in a one to two page lesson plan highlighting strategies from a single webinar. The deadline for all submissions is March 20th. And you can also email me at the email address listed on this slide for the official enrollment form and details. To wrap up my portion of the presentation, hopefully you saw some courses that piqued your interest and we hope that you will consider adding our fully online GATE program to your credentials. This slide has my contact information as well as my directors, so please feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Today's presenter is Diane Hecox, and Diane is an Associate Professor of Education at St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota. She is a national and international consultant and PD trainer on a variety of topics related to teaching and learning. She has also served, served as a GATE teacher and administrator. We're very excited to have her logged in today to present on the topic, Motivating the Gifted but Reluctant Learner. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand the presenter ball over to Diane, and it's my pleasure to introduce her um, so that she can begin her portion of the presentation.
And Diane, I'm not sure if you did you mute yourself through. Uh, no, I did not. Your telephone. So, okay, I, perfect. Okay, hey, greetings from Minnesota where it's snowing. So if most of you are from California, um, take great joy in your in your sunny, warm days. Uh, our topic for today is motivating the gifted but reluctant learner. And to some teachers that's a little confusing because in some schools, if you're not achieving, then you must not be gifted. In other schools, they recognize that giftedness is just a promise. and realize that there are some gifted students who do not fulfill their potential. In order to continue our conversation, on this slide I have my email address, um, my website, my Twitter address, and I encourage you if you have questions or, or comments to contact me. The, the photo on this particular slide is downtown Minneapolis as seen from the Stone Arch Bridge. So if you've not been to Minneapolis, please come and visit us. The materials and strategies that we're using in this session is out of my book, Differentiated, Differentiation for Gifted Learners, co-authored by Richard Cash. Um, the book received uh, a recognition as a uh, 2014 winner of the Legacy Book Award from the Texas Association for Gifted and Talented, which we're delighted of because our particular award focused on best books for teachers, and that's what we'd like to do. The first thing that we need to talk about a little bit is the definition of underachievement. It, it's important that we understand that not all students who underperform are underachievers because underachievement is a discrepancy between the potential and the performance. And so what I mean by this is the innate ability of the child or their gifts and their actual achievement, how they're doing in school, their grades, um, what's reflected on, on whatever your electronic um, grade book. One other distinction about underachievement that's important is that it's severe and persistent discrepancy. Some of the underachievers I have worked with have had short-term periods of time where everything dives, where they're not turning in their work, when they're not engaging, when they're not motivated to do their work, and they get past that because it's a, it's a variety of issues that are short-term. But when we talk about actual underachievement, we're, we're thinking about severe and persistent. The underachievers that I worked with, um, many of them began their underachievement at the elementary school and continued it into the secondary. The um, the other thing that we need to consider is that there are different ways that underperformers look in our classrooms. And so what I'd like you to do as you look at these three descriptions is I'd like you to think about students that you know. Think about gifted students that you know who are struggling in school or not fulfilling their potential and think about whether this describes them. The first lens to consider is students who are non-producers. These students are probably the most frustrating to teachers because they don't do the daily work, they don't do the homework, they don't engage in classroom tasks, but when you do summative assessment or you look at their standardized test scores, it's like, wow. So in other words, they didn't have to do the daily work in order to achieve the learning goals. In fact, some of them may have had those learning goals achieved before they ever walked in the door of your classroom. So think about this. Do you see some non-producers, kids who do not engage but yet still do brilliant in terms of their learning. A second, con a second lens to consider your students is whether they're selective producers. Again, these are kids that are frustrating to us as teachers frequently because the reality is these kids know they're capable, they know they're smart, they know that they can do the work. Many of them enjoy learning. The problem is they don't engage in, in tasks unless it's of interest to them. One of the ways I think about it is like to, the, to selective producers, school is a giant buffet table. And what they do is they review the buffet table and they say, yes, I'll do that, and no, I won't do that. So what you see is some splendid work, and then we see other times when they don't even attempt to do the work. The final lens is the underachiever, and what distinguishes the underachiever from non-producers and selective producers is the severity of the underachievement and the discrepancy, and that it's persistent over a period of time. 
These are our takeaways for our time together today. By the end of our session, you'll understand that there are particular factors that may result in underachievement for gifted learners. You'll understand that there are essential elements that increase gifted students' interest and passion in academics. And finally, by the end of our session, you'll be able to determine specific interventions for underperforming gifted students. First, what we need to do is just take a look at what are some of the factors that influence academic achievement. Again, what I encourage you to do is to think about students who you, who you work with who may be underperforming. The first factor related to academic achievement is academic self-perceptions. This is how students evaluate their abilities to do well in school. Um, the way they perceive themselves as a student influences the kinds of activities they choose, the degree to which they challenge themselves in those activities, and how persistent they are. Basically, academic self-perception is reflected when students say, what do I believe about myself as a learner? The second factor related to achievement in school has to do with attitudes towards school. Um, typically, students who do well in school are also interested in learning. Underachievers may have negative attitude, may have far more negative attitudes towards school than average or high achievers. What the research does not tell us is if one causes the other. In other words, is the lack of, is the poor attitude related to the, to the underachievement or, or how that works exactly. Um, the third factor is attitudes towards teachers and schools. Um, the student attitudes are affected by the student's interest and motivation. They're also affected by a teacher's personality and organizational skills. Some underachievers have issues with authority figures, so you need to think about that. Research suggests that students with a positive attitude towards their teachers and their classes and coursework have higher achievement levels. The next factor to consider when you're thinking about your student is motivation and self-regulation. Together or separate, they affect achievement. Self-regulation refers to the student's thoughts, feelings, and actions related to attaining goals. However, students need to be motivated to use self-regulation strategies. How well students self-regulate can be observed by us in the classroom by thinking about the degree of effort the students are exerting towards reaching a goal. The final factor that we need to consider when we're thinking about our struggling gifted learner is goal value the value that the student has for goals. It's the degree to which the student perceives a task to be important and of interest to them. Achievement is more likely when students view a task as enjoyable, important, and useful. Some of the research around underachievement of gifted learners has been done by Betsy McCoach and Del Siegley. They have uh, suggested to us some potential causes of underachievement amongst gifted learners. And I think these, again, are important for us to consider when we're thinking about our struggling learner. First is an unusual or unexpected event in the student's life. What this means is, is the student new to your school? Are they new to the neighborhood? Has there been a change in their family structure? For example, a new baby, a divorce, a remarriage. It also can relate to family circumstances, such as unemployment or health issues with uh, the significant adults in their lives. So that would be something to think about is, has there been an unexpected event in my student's life? Second is power and control issues. And this was probably the most difficult thing that I dealt with, with my students who were underachievers, because it was like a tug of war. Um, there were imbalances in the power situation within the family, either the family saying you will and the students saying I won't, or the other power and control issue is teachers saying you will and students say I won't. Keep in mind that kids do have control over their own underachievement. In other words, they can decide what they will and will not do. So it's important, whether it's the classroom or the family, that we have rules, we have guidelines, that we're consistent, and that we have limits uh, around student behavior. A third factor noted by Siegley and McCoach is conflicting messages. 
what happens with this is that the students either get mixed messages or vague messages, and that could be from the teacher or it could be from the parent. I think it's important that there's some sort of agreement around expectations. And so the agreement about, around expectations can be the parent and the student and the teacher, or it may be the parent and the student or the student and the teacher. But they, we have to, as my superintendent used to say, sing off the same song sheet. So we need to agree on expectations for student performance. And sometimes with underachievers, you have to be very specific. What I mean by this is it's not good enough for some underachievers to be told, finish your science lab notebook assignment. Many gifted students have difficulty as underachievers proceduralizing a task, what do I specifically need to do? So it would be it's tremendously helpful if you say to the student, what I need you to do is I need to, you to make sure that you know the data that you collected during the science experiment. I want you to analyze that data. And then what I want you to do is summarize your conclusions related to the lab work. Now, do you see? how much more specific that is, and the student is giving much more guidance related to what are the expectations. The fifth uh, cause of underachievement amongst gifted learners is a fixed mindset of intelligence. <laughs> Many of you may be familiar with mindset from the work of Carol Dweck. And what, what Dweck asks us to consider is that we have some students in our classrooms who have what's called a fixed mindset, and other students within our classroom who have a growth mindset. What we want is a growth mindset. So let's first take a look at a fixed mindset, and again, keep reflecting on that student that is challenging you. A fixed mindset is really a belief that what, you're born this way. In other words, you're either good in science or you'll never be good in science. You're good in math or you'll never be good in math. Um, it is a, a, a student who focuses on how smart they are. They will seek out tasks that they know they can do well in, and they may reject opportunities to learn if they might make mistakes. So in other words, what we talk about in, in gifted education is that fear of failure. If I do this, how do I know it's going to be good? And so a fixed mindset, it, it has to do with um, if you have ability, then it should be easy. You shouldn't have to put any effort in. So to the students with a fixed mindset, ability equals success. What we want from our students is what Dweck calls a growth mindset. And with a growth mindset, what students recognize is that I can get better if I put some effort in and if I persist. So students with a growth mindset believe they can develop their abilities and their skills. They easily take on challenges because they know that over time they can get better. And finally, they persevere. Um, even if there's a temporary setback, they will bounce back from there and continue to try. With a growth mindset, what students believe is effort, dedication, and persistence make a difference. And effort and persistence will equal success. Now, what I'd like you to consider is in, in thinking about the two kinds of mindsets, the student that you are thinking about, where do you think they fall? Do they fall in the fixed mindset where you're born this way and therefore you shouldn't have to work very hard? Um, or were they, are they, do they present themselves as a growth mindset, that they've made that connection that effort and persistence make a difference? One of the students that I worked with as an underachiever, when I began working with him at the elementary as a gifted ed resource person and continued the work in the middle school, I remember once he entered sec secondary, he used to say this to me, I used to be smart. What he meant by that is elementary was pretty darn easy, and they could go, he could scoot through the elementary curriculum, put in very little effort, very little attention, and do very well, thank you. But then suddenly at the secondary level, there was more challenge, there was more complexity, um, there, were, there was much more new content and many more new skills. And what he didn't know is how to put forth the effort and the persistence and even the study skills in order to achieve the learning goals. So to Jim, he used to be smart. That would certainly stand for the fixed mindset. You're born this way and you shouldn't have to put any effort into work in order order to be um, successful in school. Okay. 
Okay, I am having problems. I cannot forward the slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, the other thing that, uh, that we need to consider is that some students have beliefs that pose problems for them. Um, and this is, these beliefs you hear, but then you can also see them. So I'd like you to think about, have you heard this? Have you seen this? Uh, one of the beliefs that gifted learners have is that um, they have the skills to do well. However, they also have that fear of failure, that what if I try and I fail? And so in language, what you'll hear from the kids is, I'm just not very good at this, or I was never good at this, or I don't know if I can get better at this. A second problematic belief is that they do not always see the work that we are asking them to do as meaningful. Now, how does that sound? You'll hear things like, this is dumb and this is a waste of my time, if that is a belief issue with them. And finally, there are some underachievers who really believe forces are working against them. And it doesn't matter how hard they work or how much effort they put in, it's not going to help their situation. Um, how that sounds in a classroom is sometimes the teacher doesn't like me and does not want me to succeed. So think about that. Are you hearing messages? Are you observing behaviors such as that? There are also threads that we should be aware of related to the research around underachieving gifted students. First one we have to keep in mind is the majority of underachieving gifted students are male. And for male underachievers, this begins very early in kindergarten and grade one. So those of you who are second or third grade teachers, these students are already pretty much dug in when they get to you. So the patterns of laziness related to learning and work began in K-1, and you're seeing the results of the digging in related to those poor um, learning habits by second and third grade. Um, a second issue that you should be aware of is that with underachievers, often what you see are inconsistent parenting techniques. In other words, um, the, the the, there, there has not been the agreement we talked about earlier related to what are the expectations. The students may lack limits and boundaries, and their expectations of the parents have not been clear and specific. Another rather interesting thread related to the, to the research is overly lenient or overly strict parenting. So when you reflect back on conferences with the parents of the student you have in mind this afternoon, would that characterize the parenting situation? And then finally, um, is, is in the work that I did with underachievers, one of the things I frequently said when we met with teachers is, tell me who these kids hang out with. Very often what you find is that non-achievers hang out with other non-achievers. If a school is worthless, it's not worth my time, the kids that they associate with have the same sort of negative attitude about school. But what we don't know based on the research is whether non-achievers are a cause of underachievement, associating with non-achievers is a cause of underachievement, or whether it's a result of being an underachiever. And I think that's something really important for us to think about. But do look at the social group. Who's influencing their attitudes towards school and learning? Because that can be very helpful as we consider a plan of action for these students. Rosa Beth Moss Cantor wrote a book on confidence and success. And when, when she wrote about schools, what she said is that every day students ask two questions. Will the system support me or let me down? In other words, is the teacher in this for me? Does the teacher want me to be successful? Does the classroom, does the school support my school success? The other question that she contends that students ask is basically, is it worth it? If I could either succeed or fail, is it really worth the investment of time, energy, effort, and ideas in order to be successful? So consider the, the, whether the students that you are working with who are struggling in school have the kind of confidence that they need for success in school, or is this an issue with them? What, um, what has been suggested by Cantor is that students are on uh, winning streaks or losing streaks. 
And when, again, considering um, your student, if the student um, is on a winning streak, what occurs is that the student truly, truly believes they can learn. They can accomplish this. It's that growth mindset. And because they have a belief and a confidence in themselves as learners, they have positive feelings about school, about learning. And because of those positive feelings, they desire to do well. And this is a critical piece because if they desire to do well, they then understand that time and effort needs to put, be put into this work if I'm going to be successful. So if students feel positive about themselves in school and they put in the time and effort, it most likely ends up with a success. And every time a child, every time a student experiences success, it bumps their academic self-esteem and their self-perceptions to the positive. So if students are in a winning cycle, they have setbacks, yes, but they move on from them. What they recognize is I can put in extra effort. And if I put in extra effort, you know what, next time I may be successful or it may be a victory for me. So each time these students are in a success cycle, their academic self-esteem rises. Now with underachievers, we have something else going on. We have a cycle of failure. In this situation, the student really questions whether they can learn. You may hear things like, I'm not good at this, this has always been hard for me. If the student has those kinds of self-doubts about themselves as learners and their ability to be successful in school, they then have negative feelings about school and about learning. If they feel negative and they lack confidence, what happens is they don't put in the time and effort that's necessary for them to be successful. And when you don't put the time and effort in and you think you can't do it, what results is either big F or little f. And by little f, what I mean is I, I fell short on the tasks that we did today in class. Big F means a failure to achieve the goals, the learning goals, over a grading period. So it's important for us to think about, is a child in one of these cycles, and what can I do to bump the child out of it? Because with losers, they're always disappointed. And every time they fail with a big F or a small F, it just in, it, it, it reinforces the idea, see, I'm not that smart. And this academic self-esteem continues to diminish with these students. Another model that many of you may be familiar is the work of Francois Gagné from the University of Quebec at Montreal. Um, what Gagné did, which is very significant, is he made a distinction between what are gifts and what are talents. Basically, he clarified that gifts are what you're born with, your natural abilities, and that may be cognitive or physical. Then on the talent side are much more specific fields of excellence. So in other words, a child could be intellectually gifted coming into kindergarten, but we don't know over time whether that student is going to be a fabulous writer or a scientist or someone who, who is, um, works in biomedical engineering. We don't know where, what's going, what talents are going to emerge. For some students, the talents emerge very early. Actually, I've worked with students who the talents were already out in kindergarten. However, for other students, their talents may come out later. What determines whether a gift becomes a talent is what happens in that middle, what Gagné calls catalysts. In the catalyst area, to summarize it, it is basically, does the child put in the time, does the child put in the effort, and does the child have the opportunity to develop talents? So in other words, what Gagné helps us understand is that you can indeed be gifted, but not talented. And that's significant. I also have found that's a significant thing to talk to parents about because uh, what you're born with doesn't fulfill your potential unless you engage in the training, learning, practice effort and you have the opportunity to develop that particular talent. We're going to look at two different intervention plans uh, that you can consider in working with underperforming gifted learners. We're going to look at McCoach and Siegley's ideas, and then we're going to pull from um, Richards and my book on uh, differentiation for gifted to suggest another 
intervention that you might consider with your students. So let's first look at what Betsy and Dell have to say. What they, one of the things that they suggest is that there is a problem with gifted underachievers related to their value for the learning goal. And so their suggestions in terms of what to do to increase the value of learning goals is if teachers would identify the interests, the values, and the future plans of the students, and then find some way to use those interests, values, and futures plans into the content. So there's a connection between the interests and values and uh, topics within your curriculum. Um, another issue or another way to go at increasing the value for goals is if students can see how what they are learning is useful now as well as being useful in the future. So keep those ideas in mind in terms of goal, goals. Um, I'm showing you an interest inventory that is used at the curriculum level. Many of us do interest inventories with students at the beginning of the year, and what we do is we gather sort of general information. What are some topics you're interested in? What do you like to do in your free time? Um, how do you use technology? Those kinds of things. If you notice what this inventory is, it's an inventory specifically about an upcoming poetry unit. And past experience told me as a teacher that poetry was not something that a lot of my kids were really energized about. So by doing an inventory at the beginning of the unit, I was able to take their interests, determine how I could motivate them to be actively engaged in the poetry unit. So what you see is I ask some general questions like favorite poem and favorite poet. Then it kind of drilled down where I'm saying, which of these poetry formats have you engaged in, and how do you feel about it? Was this one of your favorites? Uh, I suggest that what are some activities we might do within the classroom? And these are things that I have in mind, but what I want to do before I even start the unit is I want to get some feedback from the students related to what would they find pleasurable, what would they be interested in, what would they most enjoy. And then finally, number eight at the bottom, I ask them, how interested are you? in poetry, and I'm ask, asking them to rate themselves from one, very interested, to ten, not very interested. Well, when I can take a look at those, those um, ratings, I know right away how hard this is going to be for me as a teacher and how much I have to really focus on using the interests um, and, the, um, and the enjoyment information I got from them in motivating them to actively engage in the unit. So that would be an idea that you could think about related to the interest piece. Um, another suggestion from Siegley and, and from McCoach is that there should be instructional interventions. And for those of you who come from Renzulli land, if you're familiar with Joseph Renzulli's model on giftedness and on engagement and program models, um, one of the things that he promotes is interest-based, strength-based activities with the support of curriculum mentors. So that mentor may, may be you as a teacher, but it also may be a community member that you think can give better feedback to the students than you could. For example, I had a student, a sixth sixth grader who was on an independent interest-based project on architecture. And I certainly could not give him the kind of feedback in his development of a design as an architect could. So we use someone within our community. Um, in Renzulli language, this is a type three. Uh, so if you're familiar with um, Renzulli's model, um, the instructional intervention would be um, a type three. Uh, what Richard and I believe, what we believe is that instructional needs and differences need to be addressed on a daily basis. So a special project itself is not enough. We need daily differentiation. We also believe that with underachieving gifted learners, we need to restore their accountability for this problem. And finally, what we want to do is promote collaboration um, with other students within the classroom. And we'll talk specifically about how that works. Jennifer Fredericks 
really informed the work that Richard and I did as we thought through um, the underachievement intervention. And one of the things that she talks about in research is, her research is framed around, is in what ways can we develop interest and passion in academics with gifted learners? And what she suggests is this. First of all, there has to be complexity, that gifted students are far more engaged and enthusiastic about learning if it's meaningful, challenging, and complex. Secondly, they're much more interested in learning if they are posing and solving real problems. Third, they need to have opportunities to incorporate outside interests and future plans. The last two points really f are framed around the use of choice in the classroom. Um, First of all, gifted students are more motivated if they have a choice over the kinds of activities they work on. So opening up even uh, assessment tasks to choice is extremely helpful, or more than one way of going at something. And finally, uh, also related to choice, is that gifted students like to have some control about how they work on the task. So when we look at uh, choice over kinds of activities, that's really the products, right? And how do I complete the task is really the process. So the language that we use in differentiation, content, process, product, holds up in, in, our, in our look at interest and passion in the academics. So what, what, what I believe is that um, if these are the elements that increase student, gifted students' interest and passion for academic work, why wouldn't that be one thing we would use as a lens in differentiating instruction. And in differentiating instruction, keeping those elements in mind, this can then pull up the um, underachievers. Keep in mind that, again, it's very important that instructional needs and differences are addressed on a daily basis. It shouldn't be once a week when the resource teacher comes in or once a week when the students go out to a send-out program or just special projects. It needs to be daily differentiation. So we have to have opportunities for us to adjust curriculum um, and engage students um, in learning the practice of perseverance. Um, so we believe that it needs to go past just special events, but deep, appropriate differentiation. Um, when we wrote the book, one of the things that we wanted to do was really answer the question, how is differentiation for gifted learners different than how I differentiate for other learners within my classroom? So that's what we're really trying to do is create some distinctions. A second recommendation that Richard and I, I have related to um, interventions is to restore accountability. Um, one of the things that I learned in working with underachievers, if I would say to them, tell me about the grade you got, you know, tell me how the learning went this term. Some of them had, were absolutely clueless about how they got the grades that they got. In other words, they didn't know where they fell short in learning goals. They didn't know whether the teacher used labs and homework or daily work as part of the grade, but they did not know what was underneath the grade. So it's important that the students face the facts. In other words, they accept the responsibility for whatever the problem, whatever problem or problems occurred that resulted in their lack of performance. Secondly, you need to have priorities. In other words, most of the students that I worked with who were underachievers, there were multiple things going on with them, not just one thing. There were multiple things. So therefore, it's important in order to not have them slide back into a cycle of failure that you prioritize and you say, the first thing we're going to work on is this. So if it's the lab reports for science, we're going to tackle that first, even if there may be other problems related to practice and effort. We're going to take one thing at a time and determine small, attainable steps so we can break the failure cycle. Finally, I think it's absolutely critical that we use ongoing descriptive feedback. Feedback from the teacher that's, that answers the question, what did I do well? And specifically, how do I improve? Many of you are probably familiar with um, the work around descriptive feedback and its, its um, impact on achievement and learning. So I'll give you a little bit more detail about that shortly. It is important that you develop a plan with the students around the underachievement, taking one issue at a time and making a plan that is doable. What I really believe is you need a short-term goal 
that is attainable with effort. In other words, it's not a giveaway. They do have to put some effort in to accomplishing this goal. The other thing I'd like you to consider is that a check-in is necessary pretty much at the daily level on how the plan is going, how the goals are working uh, in grades one through three. When the child reach, reaches fourth grade and on into the secondary, I think week, weekly check-ins are sufficient. But keep in mind that if the plan is tanking, it's not working, then we have just to be ready to modify and adjust the plan as necessary. And remember to continue to persist, even though we may be tempted to give in or give up, continue to persist. One of the tools that is in um, the making uh, the differentiation for gifted book is a, a set of questions that you can use to interview students about their school performance. And the questions are framed around learning, around study habits, around managing schoolwork, around setting goals, and around dealing with personal issues. So you can, in fact, sit down with the student and conduct an interview to answer the question, what's going on? You know, why the non-production? Why the selective production? Why the underachievement? Then also included in the book and in your handouts slides um, is a goal setting plan. And I do think it's important that you get the plan down in writing. Um, please pay attention to the fact that the focus is certainly on the student. For example, number one is what is one area of school performance you really want to work to improve? In other words, if a goal setting plan is set up by the parents or the teacher, what makes us think that the students could be motivated to engage in it? So they need to be part of this process. Um, so you're going to do a short-term goal, and then you're going to do a long-term goal. The other uh, important elements about this with underachievers is that basically you ask them, why do you need to reach this goal? If they can't tell you um, what's good about reaching the goal, you're going to have problems. And uh, good about reaching the goal cannot be to make my parents happy. It has to be much deeper than that. Notice also that in the goal setting plan, we're talking about obstacles and solution. What are, what are the things that are going to keep you from achieving this goal? And then what's the solution to that obstacle? I will guarantee you that unless you get obstacles and solutions out during the planning, the obstacles will be the excuses you will hear when the plan fails. So it's better to front load that and uh, plan for it and have the student um, have ideas about how to get around that obstacle. Um, notice also that we've I, there's a section for check-in dates and signatures. I really encourage that you have um, parent, teacher, and student or a friend sign this. And I also encourage students to post the goal someplace where they're going to see it every day. So at the elementary level, if that means if they've got desks that the tops come up, paste it in there, in your locker, at home, um, in the bathroom, um, uh, or by your breakfast table. But that goal has to be in front of them on a consistent basis or there's problems. Just a little bit more detail on descriptive feedback because we're finding that this has uh, very powerful effects on student learning. A lot of what we do in schools is evaluative feedback. In other words, pointing out to the student what they failed to do rather than what they succeeded in doing. And to the student, that feels a lot like critique. When we do descriptive feedback, it's constructive and helpful, and we're answering the questions question, how can I do better? So when we do descriptive feedback with students, what we're doing is we're coaching them towards better performance and increased achievement and learning. When we do descriptive feedback with the students, um, you want to, with the students, share why an action was correct. You want them to be able to see what has and hasn't been achieved, you want to give them ideas on how they can perform in better ways or have better approaches. And you want to suggest specific ways to improve student performance and learning. So what I like to do is what Rick Stiggins calls stars and steps. And what that means is when I'm going to do descriptive feedback, the first thing I'm going to do is comment on the strengths. I'm going to say what was done well and why, comment on their progress, Notice, note what strategies they used effectively. And then the steps part is answers the question, how can I get better or what next? So
So after the STAR, the strengths, then you give them the steps to better performance. And that can be a specific way they can improve the work that they've done, an alternative strategy that might work better for them. You can also compare their work to the rubric and be able to talk with them on this is an area that you can focus on next. So it's important that with the students, descriptive feedback is highly, highly specific and that the, you handle it through the stars and steps method. Um, the final thing that I wanted to talk with you related to intervention is collaboration. And there is a difference between cooperative learning and collaboration. And many of you probably know the research around cooperative learning and gifted learners, and it's not good, okay? So what I want you to do is be aware of, of the differences between cooperative groups and collaborative groups, and when we group for instruction and we, when we group for cooperative tasks. If you are using cooperative learning in your classroom, you are grouping by difference. So as you form the groups, they're mixed readiness, or you may form a group and have a leader in each group, or if you or a worker be in every group to avoid the slackers that may be in each group. But you may, when you choose groups for cooperative learning, you have something in mind related to the mix of the students. Another way that we are grouping by differences is if we have tasks and we say you could do a newspaper, um, you can do a, a web page, you could do a brochure, students group themselves based on interest in a particular product or activity. And then finally, which ends up being a random group, and then finally we have groups that are formed by student choice, and that would be saying to the students, for example, uh, three, no more than three people in a group, make your own group. In differentiation, what we're doing is we're doing flexible instructional grouping. In other words, the students who are working as a group or as a collaborative team are grouped by likeness, not difference. Uh, teachers prescribe. They decide who goes in what group. They base um, their grouping on a common instructional needs. All of these kids need a little bit more time on this. Or they base them on likenesses in their readiness in their learning profile or in their interest. But when we're uh, grouping for differentiation, it is teacher prescribed. And that's an important thing to think about. Um, I do want you to uh, want to share a little bit more information about cooperative learning and gifted learners. Problem with cooperative learning with gifted students is that a lot of cooperative learning tasks are at low-level blooms. It's memorization. It's low-level application. It's not complexity. And what we know is gifted students need complexity. So what I'm suggesting is rather than cooperative learning, you consider collaborative learning and, and grouping by likeness. Likeness. In collaborative learning, the focus is on both the reproduction and the production of knowledge. And they construct shared meaning through their conversations with their group members. There are two um, collaborative models that could, can certainly be recommended for gifted learners. One is Aronson's work on thematics. And the way that this would look in a classroom is that a theme is introduced. For example, I'm a social studies teacher, grade five, and I am framing my work in social studies around a theme on freedom. Um, what students then do is individually they engage in exploration of a sub-theme of their choice. And you may actually give them some questions to try to structure um, their pursuit. Uh, as an example, uh, students may examine personal freedom. They may examine uh, freedom from the perspective of a nation's diverse population. They may consider freedom from historical uh, perspectives, like what did freedom mean during the American Revolution, and what did freedom mean during the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, so in this way, the students have individual accountability, and then they return to work with their collaborative group. The other uh, cooperative learning strategy is the Slavin strategy, and with this, students are, are are given specific tasks. So in other words, the teacher matches the task to the needs of the specific students. So you have students who are A's, students who are B's, and students to C. The actual group work, uh, the, the group work is done in a, in a, a, a collaborative group that is an A, B, and C. However, 
they meet in research groups. So all the A's meet together, all the B's work meet together, all the C's meet together. So in this way, you can differentiate the tasks. The research group then is based on likeness, not difference. They discuss their ideas, and then they return to their base group. In other words, the A, B, and C mix together to share and learn from each other. So in terms of cooperative learning, or what I prefer you to say, I prefer to call collaborative learning, um, I think these two models will work for gifted students. Then you also will find a slide um, on how to build initiative. These are things that we can do in order to increase initiative for learning, like uh, paying attention to what matters most, commenting on things that matter to the students, always looking forward, not back. So yesterday, yes, I didn't get their work done, but today's another day. And remember to start small and recognize uh, small victories. Don't wait till the end of the term. As, as our time's coming to a close, what I'd like you to think about is what word could you use to summarize what you've learned during this webinar? And also think about why did you choose that word? So whether it's now or after the conclusion of the webinar, I really um, would like you to think about what word would summarize what you've learned, and also, why did you choose that word? And if we were all together, I'd have you share. Um, what I'd like you to do is um, remember to um, keep in touch if you have uh, questions or concerns or you want to share a something that worked. I would love to hear your great ideas that are happening in your classroom. So again, there's information about how to contact me. Um, Lisa, it uh, looks like we have about three minutes left. Do we yes. want to see if we have some questions or comments? Sure. If anybody has a question for Diane, we do have a couple minutes, so feel free to submit your question in the chat panel. And then also submit a word like Diane's uh, previous slide had mentioned, please submit your word in the chat panel. And if you submit it to all panelists, then both uh, Diane and myself will be able to see that coming in. So we'll we'll stay on. Next just best a few thing more to minutes. having you with me <laughs> mm -hmm. is if you put your word in the chat. <laughs> yes. So feel free, use that chat panel. Oh, growth mindset. So important. Thank you, Sarah. Perseverance, wow, that's a, that's a powerful one because they want to give up. Being positive, thank you, Kat, thank you, Kathy. Lynn says goals. Um, Casey says being informative. Um, uh, Bill says what can we do as parents if teachers don't grasp the, the issue? I think that what we need to do, everyone, is form a partnership with the parents. And I really, when, when we begin a plan on underachievement, I always have a conference with the parents, and I want to find out what's happening at home. What do they notice? What are the students' interests? What are they passionate about? Sometimes their outside interests aren't reflected in the work of schools. So I think it's really important that you sit down with those parents, and they are part, along with the students, of developing the action plan. Um, copy of presentations and handouts. Uh, Lisa, I think you said a link is going to be set. Sent Correct. To them. Yes, we will be sending out a recording link to this uh, webinar presentation tomorrow. Yeah, I, um, Jean mentioned the investment, ours in them and theirs in us. I think that's absolutely true. There has to be that connection between the student, and the student certainly needs to know that we care about their learning and we care about their school success. It's a good one too. One step, one student at a time. Yes, thank you. Um, let's see if there's any other questions here. Oh, uh, question. There's one question here. It says, wouldn't this be applicable to all learners? And, you know, in response to that, when I started working with underachievers and I looked at the literature specifically, there were a lot of general characteristics of underachievers along the learning spectrum. Um, that, that I also saw present in my gifted underachievers. But what we have to remember is that there, there are certain characteristics and attributes of giftedness that puts them in a position where underachievement is a risk. And those attributes and characteristics of gifted learners differ from the rest of the population. But certainly, I would suggest that many of the points and the planning forms and the student interviews, those kinds of things could be used with any student that you see struggling in school, keeping in mind that there are certain characteristics of, and attributes of gifted learners that put them at risk 
for underachievement. Uh, Wonderful. Okay. And I, I still see some questions coming in. For all mm -hmm. of you, we are coming to a close. So if you could please send your questions. I have my email address here listed on the slide. Let me go one slide forward. And this has Diane's contact information. So if mm -hmm. you think of a question or a comment or you want to give your one word to Diane to let her know kind of your takeaway from her presentation, um, please do feel free to send them our way um, via email. And you will be receiving an email uh, tomorrow with a link to this recording. So if you want to rewatch the webinar and if you think of any questions while watching the recording, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Well, thank you so much, Diane, for the time that you spent yes. with us tonight sharing all of this great information. Again, please keep the conversations going to all of you who are logged in um, by contacting Diane or contacting myself, and I can forward on any questions that you may have um, to her as well. Yes, thank you, all of you, for taking your time out of your busy day. Um, if you're in California, go, go enjoy the sunshine. If you're here in the Midwest, get out your shovel. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Aww. Best wishes for your future and, <laughs> and the challenges of helping all kids be successful in school, because that's what it's all about. Thanks so much. Well said. Thank you. And, and to all of you who are logged in, hopefully you enjoyed the webinar tonight and have some takeaways. Um, we do encourage you to log in and continue on with us on the same day and time next week as we continue our webinar series with Connecting Thinking and Language with Gifted Students, Elevating the Rigor. All of the information is listed on this slide. So if you haven't already, please do register for the webinar by um, visiting the link on this slide. And then also, some of you have already contacted me, those of you who are interested in the credit option for this webinar series. Um, if you're logged in tonight, you're, you know, part of it has already been done. You, you do need to log into the live, the other remaining three webinars. Um, but if you have any questions or if you want that enrollment form, my contact information is listed here. So please feel free to contact me. All right, thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Thank you again, Diane, and have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.